Time has literally stood still here at the Detroit Osteopathic Hospital. Working with This city is 144 square miles, and there is thousands of abandoned buildings. You know, the school system's shot, the infrastructure's shot, everything's old and outdated, and we have no money, and we're in deficit, you know. In 1960, you know, the city had nearly two million people, you know, and then now we have 750,000 people. That's it's, it's over a million people have left the city, and that's why we have the abandonment that we have, you know. It's, it's horrible. I'm all for it. I play my part. I do what I can. Um, but I'm just one person, you know, in a, in, in a city of hey, 750,000 people. If you open the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times and you see the word Detroit, the chances are they're not talking about the condition of the city, they're talking about the condition of the automobile industry. You've seen a city trying to expand beyond the auto industry, but really that has been defined by one industry. The auto industry helped to make Detroit the national and international symbol of the miracles of mass production. And the decline of the auto industry has helped to make Detroit a the national and international symbol of the devastation of deindustrialization. To me, it's kind of preparing you for what other people may face in the future. We're just getting it now. So it, it's kind of, it's just making you strong. That's all it is. Everyone has a love-hate relationship with the city. You love it, and at the same time, you hate it. I love Detroit. That's it. Yeah. Welcome to Detroit, Michigan, historically known as the Paris of the Midwest, the arsenal of democracy, the Motor City, Motown, or sometimes just the D. The slogans and nicknames no longer seem to fit the harsh reality of this now bankrupt town. Presenting a much less glamorous view in autumn 2009, Time magazine had its own name for Detroit. The cover is the fruit of the hard work put in by two young French photographers. They've been coming here for several years. Like Bob in his hospital, all they can do is document the decline of a symbol which once seemed immortal. When we arrived in 2005, we discovered a town with a lot of abandoned buildings, office blocks, theaters, hotels. What interested us was the difference between what these structures, which were made to inspire dreams, to be visually impressive, were intended to convey and what they eventually became. Look at your mother, she's still staring at me. Well, who would stare at you? What we're trying fight. to do with this photo is to capture these places before they disappear. But yes, you have the feeling that the decline is somehow accelerating. In the United States, there is this consumerist tendency which leads people to dispose of buildings in the same way they dispose of products. This used to be one of Detroit's most impressive theaters. Closed more than 20 years ago, the thieves and vandals have taken their toll. This neighborhood used to bustle with life. Dozens of European immigrant families settled here in the early 20th century. You better go take your test. I'm gonna go get smart, y'all. We're collecting information about working class people here, the, the, the objects of their everyday life. And, you know, it sort of creates a more complete social history of Detroit. Underneath Detroit was founded by a Frenchman in 1701, but that's of interest to just a handful of archaeology students. 
There is so much to do on the biggest excavation site in industrial America. But it's got this patina, you can see. A lot of areas like this in Detroit today are abandoned, but or, or it, it, for, it serves as a park like this yeah. today. And you don't get a sense uh, standing here today of the once thriving neighborhood that existed here before the park. Since it shut in 1988, this huge train station has become one of the favorite hunting grounds for the town's amateur photographers. When I was first here was when it was still operational back in the late 60s. Uh, my mother, uh, my sister and I came down to pick my grandfather up. He'd taken a train to uh, Washington, D.C. and So we came and came in through that door and it was like walking into a cathedral. It's got that huge vaulted ceiling and but it was quite an experience when I was 10 years old or so. So when they couldn't find a use for the building after the train travel just you know completely fell apart in the, in the 70s that was uh, closed down, it was kind of inevitable. But it's just another sad chapter in, in what's happened to Detroit. Detroit is so gorgeous. I mean, you, you drive through the city, you see the stonework, the masonry work, the, the architecture, just everywhere, every little nook and cranny. You just got to look past the, the spray paint and the broken windows. They yeah. say that Detroit in its day was second only to Paris, and I can see why. You just look at the... Built in 1913, Michigan Station has welcomed hundreds of thousands of immigrants. It was the portal of a unique industrial El Dorado. In the 1920s, 5,000 immigrants disembarked here every day. Detroit represented a new Babylon, an incarnation of excess. The best architects in the world competed here, as can be seen with the Guardian Building, nicknamed the Cathedral of Finance, constructed in 1928, a triumph of Art Deco. Luxury hotels multiplied, grandiose cinemas shot up from nowhere, and the city boasted more music halls than Broadway. Many would argue, as I have, that Detroit is the quintessential city of the 20th century. It was born um, really out of um, small-scale manufacturing businesses that evolved here in the late 19th century and then they were brought together by these emerging new companies particularly through Ford and by 1910 by the beginning and the in fact the end of the First World War this was an automotive manufacturing center with all the businesses that go In 1930, Detroit grew to become the fourth largest town in the country, before the crisis of 29. Detroit has been in a state of decline in, in some fashion or another, going back to the 1930s, if you will. I mean, we never fully recovered from the Depression. You can go, there are vacant buildings, vacant warehouses in this city that have been empty since the, the, the Depression. The stock exchange crash also resulted in the reduction of the number of car manufacturers, from 18 manufacturers and after bankruptcies, mergers and acquisitions, only three were left. General Motors, Ford and Chrysler, who became known as the Three Giants. It was a golden era of full employment for a triumphant America. 
in the 50s and 60s, Detroit was a place to be. My dad talked about coming in here and walking down Woodward Avenue and outside every bar there was a job recruiter with, on a, with a folding table taking applications for the factories. That's how competitive it was. He hopped from job to job. It was so competitive. During that golden age, Detroit was rebaptized Motor City. The population expanded as 200,000 more citizens, mostly African Americans, arrived, fleeing the destitution of the agricultural South. When I arrived here in the mid 50s, the population was 2 million, but they were already building freeways to go to the suburbs. So that created depopulation, disinvestment, and all that sort of thing. They helped to destroy the city. It was also a time of difficult race relations in America. Many white people dreaded the so-called black invasion, as some refer to it. Subsequently, the whites began to move further out, taking with them their tax contributions and their businesses. The town soon spread over 300 square kilometers. Detroit music and dance go back a long way. By the 1920s, there were already numerous dance halls throughout the town. Except that, at the time, whites and blacks were segregated. This separation lasted decades, exacerbating the pre-existing divide and mutual misunderstanding. Detroit became, in the mid-50s, a city where the population was overwhelmingly becoming overwhelmingly black. And the city was at that time still run by whites. The city government, the schools. And that led to a, uh, a black power movement. And what the, the idea I think that blacks had at the time was that if we would have blacks in charge, in accordance with the democratic procedures, that things would get better. But social divisions added to economic problems complicated matters. To reduce the costs of production and stop depending on the powerful automobile unions, the big three changed their strategy. The automobile companies were grounded here, but as they grew and they became multinational companies with in, in increasing interests not only in manufacturing overseas, but eventually, as today, selling overseas, um, the, although we are still the headquartered, uh, we, we are still the home of the headquarters, a lot of the activities moved offshore. The change, though, brought with it the beginning of decline. Detroit lost 200,000 inhabitants between 1950 and 1960. Ill-informed and unresponsive, the town council was still initiating ambitious housing projects. Today, newly built middle-class neighborhoods are very rare. Those that remain have evocative road names, recalling the years of tranquility when a former Ford worker created the record shop Motown. Today, in the spot where the story began, there's a tiny museum, a pitiful reminder of what was, in appearance at least, a happy time in America. Two years after what is considered the first music video, Governor America imploded. The National Guard to restore order. Later in, in July 1967, racial deaths. conflicts ignited the city. Hundreds Detroit was the scene of some of the worst rioting in American history. Between the destruction and random gunfire, the National Guard was called in as reinforcement. In five days of rioting, 43 people were killed, and in more than 300 cases of arson, dozens of businesses were looted or destroyed. Damage ran into several million dollars. What do you think of all that? Well, I see uh, here, and I of frustration, de depravation. These young people are not going to take Les jeunes ne veulent plus endurer ce que ma génération a connu. Ils veulent du travail, des logements décents. Ils veulent faire partie de la bonne Amérique.
45 years later, and there are some who believe the Motor City is still burning. The city's spatial and social composition was forever changed by what happened. White citizens fled to the suburbs with their big shopping centers, and black citizens mostly remained in the old downtown and the peripheral neighborhoods. There are not enough people to fill the gaps left by this exodus. Detroit has lost 20% of its population, which remains at its 1930 level. It seems unlikely that the number will increase much. Today, Linwood, the district at the center of the riots, still has an unenviable record of crime and poverty. And yet, in the midst of this desolate urban landscape, a remarkable sight. Unlike humans, the fauna and flora are flourishing. Detroit is a town of contradictions. While it is dramatically shrinking, its population is getting fatter and fatter. According to an OECD study, Detroit has the fifth highest rate of obesity of any American town. However, that might all be about to change. Gardening has become a political and civic act. People are reappropriating and adding value to the open spaces where the houses used to stand. There used to be five houses here. One, two, three, four, five. When were they torn down? Oh, the last one about 15 years ago. Well, why did the people leave? I can speak for areas I've lived in and I saw I people leaving. Okay. A lot of, like this house across the street, Hi. Those, that was a family. There was a grandfather and a mother who raised their kids there. And they always had a house full of grandkids. And the day that they moved was very heartbreaking. They mortgaged their house and the payment, they could no longer afford to stay in their house. So they moved. A lot of uh, weeds and grass and brush area that hadn't been tended to for years. So we are constantly fighting uh, weeds, but these are spinach and they'll be harvested probably Tuesday or Wednesday morning for market. These are our lettuce mix. Myrtle, did you know how to do gardening before? Just a little bit. My grandmother, this is, <laughs> my grandmother, um, I gardened with my grandmother as a young girl. Mm -hmm. That's her hat? This is her hat. Mm -hmm. This was her dress up hat, but for me it's my gardening hat. So Myrtle, are you doing this out of necessity or pleasure? Necessity, and now it's pleasure. It started as a necessity. Take the water back. Yeah. Concepted by my husband. Thank you. <laughs> what I owe you? Nothing? Nothing. Great. The part that the economic or the market part of the garden plays is us trying to develop our own economic autonomy. And the community is something for all of us to eat from. Both gardens, they develop lines of communication, dialogue, um, all of these things which I needed so that we can determine our own destinies and how we survive. And plus, we eat good. We eat nutritional food that's good for us. Watering just the roots is very important. Tomatoes are fragile, they get the fungus on the leaves, and we save water by just watering the roots. Can you tell us about your plans for expansion? Um, across the street. Part of this land here is city owned, part of it's private owned. It's been vacant and we keep the grass cut, so we're going to liberate this land. Our main objective is to be a, a resource, a, a gap in that resource that's missing. We're meeting the need, we're fulfilling our family obligations, and we're participating in local economics. We're transforming uh, uh, young Detroiters, old Detroiters, from the inside out. You know, you are what you eat, you know, grow a garden, grow a community.
Detroit's real modern decline has, uh, is, is directly tied to the deterioration of the domestic auto industry. As Ford, GM, and Chrysler began crumbling, began collapsing, you had automakers come in here with products that, that with really niche market products, but very effective niche market products, small cars. Detroit didn't do them very well. Those Japanese car makers did them very well. Luxury cars. Detroit sort of lost its luxury edge. The German car makers really excelled at luxuries. And the per vehicle cost for the big three was so much higher than that of their competitors that they couldn't price as well as perhaps they should have. It really accelerated the, the decline of Detroit. But there were so many other factors. The development of the suburbs drained the city, and racial troubles drained the city, and, and bad policies and high taxes drained the city. That resulted in what we have now, the situation in Detroit, with significant amounts of, of vacant industrial space that in turn, of course, has resulted in this moniker of the empty city or whatever term you want to use. denial that we have shrunk and that we're not coming back. Five years ago, ten years ago, there would be many people who would just simply say that we would rebound and at least come back to a million people. The many neighborhoods would have come back. Uh, and I don't hear that conversation often. So the problem is it's, it's not just like one section. There's like holes uh, where the emptiness is. So there, uh, it's hard to like connect the city and that's literally one of the logistical problems of I mean, what do you do with those big holes that plague the city? It's estimated that a third of Detroit equivalent in size to San Francisco or Paris is wasteland around 100 square kilometers of lost potential The town council is trying to wipe the slate clean. They are filling the holes in the town centre with showcase green spaces. They want to breathe life back into the place, at least symbolically. Most people are looking elsewhere from an urban farming standpoint. But as I drive around the city and I go into so many of our communities, so many of our neighbourhoods, and see how many people are farming, uh, it's amazing. Based on models of French working-class gardens of the late 19th century, the numbers of spaces like these has been increasing over the last few years. There used to be a gas station located on half of this lot. Uh, it was fully remediated in 2000. Residents rent a plot for the year. Um, it's $25. We have over 150 different people in this neighborhood that garden here, including area restaurants. In 2004, there were just 80 urban gardens. Today, there are over 1,600. It's more than just a fad. This garden is definitely helping to bring the neighborhood together and bringing the neighborhood back. Um, since we built this garden three years ago, there's more development that's been happening in this neighborhood. And I think in part, this garden was a catalyst for that development. Uh, we just uh, took over a play lot two parcels over that we're going to be developing into an eco park. What's interesting is seeing that people are moving back to Detroit from the suburbs. Our numbers have grown since the last census. Um, this neighborhood is a definite example of that. Every weekend, several thousand people visit a unique place in Detroit, Eastern Market, one of the very few places in the city that is really bustling. It's a microcosm of American society in an area of several thousand square meters. Producers, large and small, from all over the city come here to sell their wares. Eastern Market is a response to the food desert, as the town center is often known, because it lacks even one large supermarket. 
Eastern market really is uh, the last, I think it's the last one of its kind left in North America. Nearly every major metropolitan area had an Eastern market and an Eastern market district. Uh, that's a local food hub. Behind me, you'll see a grown in Detroit stand. That's where the larger community gardens uh, co-op sale of excess production. If we could peel back the over-centralized, over-processed American global food system and, and take back 20% market share, we could create about 5,000 jobs, we could create about $20 million in the state and local business taxes, and we could create about $125 million of new household income. Detroit is where the future Americans, North American city is being defined. Uh, it's a more broke system than many of our other metropolitan areas. We're free to experiment with uh, different forms that other places can't right now. Detroit, with its modern-day Towers of Babel, has been punished for its successes and then ostracized by the rest of the country. To add another black mark to an already bleak picture, the subprime mortgages crisis hit in 2007. Thousands of families who were unable to pay their debts ended up on the streets. Already on its knees, Detroit did not escape the financial tornado. Before the financial collapse in 2008, the national attitude in this country towards Detroit was one of contempt. Look how they messed up their industry. Look how they messed up their town. After 2008, when much of the rest of the country sort of caught up to us in some ways, the attitude, I think, has shifted, especially among young people, to one of kind of intense curiosity and sympathy. In some respects, with young people, I feel that we're as like this national treasure that needs to be saved. We desperately need an influx of young people who are interested in a big old gritty American city and willing to try to help rebuild it. For three days this spring, 100,000 people from all over the world arrived for the annual Detroit Electronic Music Festival, beating all previous attendance records. Detroit, the birthplace of soul music, has always inspired composers and singers. It is here that techno music was born at the beginning of the 90s. Tonight, the audience is gathering to listen to Carl Craig, Detroit born and bred, and a techno pioneer. He's disappointed about what has happened to his city. I'm surprised that we haven't been able to parlay that into something fantastic by now. It's been 11, 11 episodes of the festival, and this, this sh city should have really grown quite a lot. We need folks from, from other cultures to come to Detroit and actually live in Detroit and start businesses in Detroit. But we actually need people in Detroit. Our neighborhoods have fallen apart. Um, we have uh, the possibility of buying houses for $100, $1,000, you know, $5,000 to have a house. You can buy a whole neighborhood, you know? But for that price, the neighborhood you buy will be a long way out of town and somewhat dilapidated. Individual houses, blocks of apartments, warehouses, buildings constructed to endure the ravages of the weather, all sorts of styles and locations.
Some people have even crossed the Atlantic to pursue business ventures. Oh, 50 or 60 years ago, this now half-abandoned neighborhood was magnificent. It's the Cadillac and Cacheval neighborhood. And there are some very beautiful houses that are not as well maintained today, but it's an area that will be redeveloped. And there was a unique opportunity to buy this building at auction. Around 12,000 properties were put up for sale at the end of 2010. Their owners hadn't paid their taxes, and for the cost of a small car, about $21,000, I bought a building, which is 600 square meters per floor, and it has three floors. Our objective is to develop the ground floor into an office and put four studio apartments on the first floor and four more on the second floor, and then rent them out. Dynamic real estate attracts investors, which will mean funds coming into Detroit. The money uh, we are going to spend here will enable tradesmen to redevelop this building, which will attract people to the area, and the businessmen in the surrounding area will also benefit from their custom. Oh, your neighbor. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jerome. My, my name is Jerome. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. And then this I'm a foster mom, so I have I had purchased this and I purchased the lot. Oh, you purchased the lot next door? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. excellent. So, yeah, to make them a little playground. Oh, that's cool. They're all special need kids. You oh, know? really? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's so nice. I thought I would move over here and it's glad somebody's going to do something. When did you move? I moved here in 07. In 07, so... Yeah, I haven't yeah. been here a long time. Yeah, you told me about But that. I was raised on the east side. Good, so it's going to yeah. be nice playground for the kids. It's going to be yeah. awesome. It's, it's going to be nice for this. I like this neighborhood. It's really beautiful. And it's quiet. And, you know, my neighbor um, called me and told me the church right behind there, they broke into it last night. Oh, the one behind over there? Behind, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the problem, you know. The owner yeah. of that told me this was broken into all the time. Oh, they, the yeah, time. yeah. I've called the police plenty of times. They, they just was all up in there. I'm like, they're tearing that beautiful building because they said it was beautiful in there one time. Uh, Byron. The violence contributes to the city's negative image. In just 10 months, in 2011, there were 250 cases of attempted murder, the highest figure in 10 years. Detroit is classed among the three most crime-ridden cities in America. So let me ask you another crazy question like my other one. Does smoking weed violate your probation? <laughs> so you don't care much about your probation, huh? I do. What are you on probation for, Ace? I say it was here to say. Okay, so like a five-year felony that you could go to prison for five years. In lieu of prison, they A few minutes ago, a traffic stop for disregarding a red light turned into an arrest for possession of marijuana. And the officers became alert about the marijuana because of the smells of burnt marijuana. Detroit has earned a bad reputation because of the media. Granted, we are one of the higher capitals of homicides, but as far as everyday crime, breaking and entries, larcenies, burglaries, arson, rape, shootings, it happens everywhere. I lived in the city of Detroit for 10 years and I never once had a crime committed against me. And I lived right in the heart of it all. In Detroit, there are as many churches, temples, and chapels as there are religious groups. They come in all shapes and sizes and all designs, but most of the structures are in a sorry state. St. Agnes, a Catholic church, is one of them. It was closed down in 2005. Hundreds of other buildings suffered a similar fate, such as the once splendid Lee Plaza, a famous 1930s hotel. So what can be done to save the city? 
Rejuvenation may be possible as Detroit offers one of the most incredible investment opportunities around. This particular building dates from the 19th century, 1888 in fact. It was fire station number five. At the time, it was on a par to anything being constructed in Chicago, Paris and London. That's why there are brilliant buildings in Detroit. Some of them, like this one, have been converted into lofts or restaurants. The Frenchman arrived 15 years ago, originally to work in the car industry, but has since changed direction. Jerome and his wife spotted the enormous housing market potential offered by the city. And he has found plenty of enthusiastic customers. One of the goals is to come back into, into the city. Um, and to, there's uh, areas uh, throughout the city that are being revitalized. Detroit's one with a, a storied history. Um, but it's been, the city itself and the people that reside here have always been very resilient. Uh, they've always made, been able to make ends meet one way or the other. So <clears throat> my, my faith in the city has never really wavered. Um, so I, I'm very positive for the future, I think. Detroit is a little bit too big for the population that it now has. And so its rebirth starts at the very center and grows outward. And that's a large, um, movement of people coming back to Detroit, young professionals mostly, and they occupy those places. There is a buzz of excitement, although it's limited to downtown, the heart of Detroit. On the east side of the town, the atmosphere is far less glamorous and security much more precarious. But many people here compensate for that with close neighborly and community ties. Nostalgia is also evident, bringing back memories of long-lost past times. It was beautiful before. Like my neighbor, he'd been over here forever. So, <laughs> he'd been over here since he was a little boy. All this was beautiful. All this, you know, it was homes here, the apartment was... Well, when we first arrived uh, back in 1966, it was a different neighborhood. You had uh, more houses occupied by neighbors. But then over the years it declined because people moved out and the battles have taken over, and so it's declined in recent years. All I do is just pray, because a lot of people have moved out of Detroit, but I'm not giving up on Detroit. I've been here since I was eight months old. Yeah, I'm staying. I get angry and say I want to leave. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going to go nowhere. I'm going to stay right here, make the best of it. See, this, this is a community-based neighborhood. This neighborhood needs structure, help out with the development of our young, young people. There's nothing for young people to do. They're out there going to school, they come home, there's nothing to do. So they're on the street. Um, usually that creates a lot of, you know, violence and um, trouble because they have nothing to focus on except for just being outdoors and really no, no, um, no incentive to, to do the right thing. You know, education is very important. When I was a young boy, the area was very positive. There were houses on every block, no vacant lots. There were programs for the kids, and you know, they had everything back when I was growing up. You know, this was a middle income neighborhood growing up. Now there is no middle income. There's the rich and there's the poor. So many families in Detroit moved out of Detroit for the school system. So no, it's, I mean, I wouldn't, it's hard to raise a family here in Detroit when you have young kids. School system is shot. And without a school system, you have nothing. In a city where 85% of the population is African American, the election of the first black mayor in 1973 created high hopes. Coleman Young, a magistrate for almost 20 years, could not and did not know how to solve the overwhelming problems which were paralyzing the city. Not only did we find that just electing another person, and particularly a black person, did not solve questions, but blacks could not do any better than whites had done in terms of building 
the industry and developing the city, we get the attitude to be challenged to go beyond thinking of who was in charge and whom we elected and to begin doing things ourselves. And I think that's a miracle of Detroit. The North Cass sector embodies this miracle, a fashionable area not far from the town center. It is affectionately known as Avalon, a name taken up by this bakery set up 10 years ago. Inspired by the French baguette as well as by Italian breads, Anne Perrault and her partner successfully took advantage of the organic food gold mine. At the beginning, this was considered a courageous step of activism in such a dilapidated neighborhood. We were neither business owners nor bakers when we started, and so um, we were basically people that wanted to do something that was a, um, a commitment to, to life bigger than ourselves. And where we got our inspiration was from Jimmy and Grace Boggs. Jimmy had always talked about not depending on the auto company or the big companies to develop, but that it was little and small businesses uh, and to develop your own systems and that way you could make a difference in the world. The winter before we opened, uh, there's a church a block south that had a tent city out like almost the whole winter where like almost 300 people a night were sleeping outside. So it was really, I think the city and, and this neighborhood were really in crisis when we moved here. And everyone kept telling the same narrative that it couldn't be done, it couldn't be done. And we just, we just didn't see that. The national chains and the big box stores never came here. They never saw the demographic to support their profit model, their profit margin. But what that does is it opens up a whole opportunity for small business people like us and like other people with no experience to come in and do it like the old fashioned way, like the way our grandparents, you know, and, and, and the immigrants of this country started businesses. There are a lot of people who live in the neighborhoods who've never been downtown. I mean, transportation's you know, so bad and sort of the economic stratification is so bad that there are people who are really sort of paralyzed in these neighborhoods. The schools are not good, poverty rates over 50 percent, and, um, you know, unemployment. I mean, we don't know what unemployment is, but it's probably 30 percent or something like that, really. Poverty is a big issue, access to um, healthy dynamics, you know, uh, support systems. Uh, we're definitely lacking that. I mean, we're almost a city that's collapsing on itself, you know. The, at the same time, it's a land of opportunity to create a lot of things. This pioneering neighborhood has started to attract a lot of attention and is also a model of social and ethnic diversity. About 200 meters from the bakery, there is a hair salon, which is just as trendy and activist. So can the Avalon neighborhood become the reference point for saving this anguished town? Here, they seem to think so. In fact, they're convinced of it. This is what it has become. This has become the, the heart of Detroit. If you're gonna to come to Detroit, this is the time to come to Detroit. This is it, at the Renaissance. To me, it's kind of preparing you for what other people may face in the future. We're just getting it now, which is, you know, being an entrepreneur or, you know, not having things in place that have st historically been in place, you know, pensions, insurance, whatever, all the things that are, um, you know, being discussed right now all over America. So it, it's kind of, it's just making you stronger. That's all it is. You know, the people that are coming here now are the people who are actually able to be pioneers and mold the future of Detroit. So I'm, I'm one of those people. There's a lot of people that have been working in factories and at these corporations and they're just begging and dying for an outlet just to go out, start a business and fine tune what it is that they're, their passions, what they've been wanting to do all along. I would have never thought, I lived in New York for 10 years and came back, that I would be making money doing natural hair care in Detroit. We talk about 
things that we can, you know, anything negative, what could we do in the, um, as a community to build it up? I right. Mean, we are actually providing a light, you know what I mean, in, in the midst of what people are saying is dying. Under U.S. law, Detroit is no longer eligible for federal funding, as it's fallen below the threshold of 750,000 inhabitants. The consequence of this is heavy budget cuts to the school system, to the police, and for public transport. And if that wasn't enough, the mayor must even fight with his own municipal council. City council and I are going through a process now that I don't think it's healthy. I provided a budget to city council where I did a $200 million cut in our next year budget. They said it wasn't enough. They wanted an additional $50 million cut. Another $50 million cut, there's a whole litany of things that we may have to do to reach another $50 million. Two weeks later, David Bing has had to give way, blighting his term as mayor in a town where 20% of the population no longer receive even basic services. If the three largest car manufacturers are coughing, it is really America that is sick. And in these last few years, the country has only been made sicker by the financial crisis of 2007 and the recession that followed. We were still near the bottom, a vicious recession, the worst that we've seen in our lifetimes. And ultimately, that recession cost 8 million jobs. And it hit this industry particularly hard. So in the year before I took office, this industry lost more than 400,000 jobs. In the span of a few months, one in five American auto workers got a pink slip. Ford has escaped the tidal wave thanks to its private funds. General Motors has been declared bankrupt, and Chrysler is about to go into voluntary liquidation. The choice is therefore simple for the Obama administration. Do nothing or put its hand in its pocket in order to save two national symbols of manufacturing. There was a whole part of opinion there is a large section of the public that considers the subsidies already given by the Obama government, about $7 billion, to have been wasted money, as it was almost sucked into a bogus restructuring, which would never have worked. And so the American taxpayers' money would have disappeared alongside the definitive liquidation of Chrysler. In fact, the outcome was actually quite different. Today, all three auto... American automakers are gaining market share. That hasn't happened since 1995. And today, I'm proud to announce the government has been completely repaid for the investments we made under my watch by Chrysler because of the outstanding work that you guys did. Because of you. Tout le monde ici est conscient maintenant. Everyone here is now aware that we have saved tens of thousands of jobs, keeping the money at the same time with investments elsewhere. People have to realize that we have 55,000 employees at Chrysler, most of whom work here. I don't have a ratio, but let's say that three quarters are here in Detroit or around Detroit. And if you take into account all the posts that are being created, it's close to a million. So when you think about Detroit's population, it is really a city which would have probably ended up being wiped from the map without this kind of operation. Today, the sales of these three manufacturers are the highest they've been since 2005. An agreement was reached between the powerful automobile union and the three giants. It will oversee the creation of a total of 180,000 new jobs between now and 2015. Our commitment is to add 7,000 jobs here in the U.S. by the end of 2012. We've seen um, in, uh, about a $450 million investment, uh, at least, in our uh, plant in Wayne, Michigan, which isn't far from here. And, and that's a, a, a plant that's added you know, more than 1,000 people. I think the more important thing that we've seen is continuing to have an investment in American manufacturing. And Detroit has represented that for a long time. You know, this is our home. This is, this is what, you know, Dearborn, Michigan is the place where it all started. And, you know, this is still our headquarters. The Super Bowl final in February, the most watched televised event in the United States. And one advert is causing a sensation. Eminem, child and icon of Detroit, is promoting the latest model from one of the big three. The clip has been watched 13 million times. It's still a city 
very much in turmoil, very much trying to find its answer. Uh, I think the future uh, is bright, but it's not going to happen overnight. It will take a generation and more to, to make this place vital again. You dust off the gold and, and you, you'll see it shine sometimes, but you know, this is, it, it's, it has a lot of positive to it. You know, you just have to have the people to come together and bring it out in the city. We can only hope. <laughs> This is the Motor City, and this is what we do. It's been said that what is happening to Detroit will happen to the entire country over the next 10 to 20 years. Whoa! Detroit may well turn out to be the precursor to a bigger problem, as there are currently around 100 towns in the United States which appear on the brink of collapse.